Hello and welcome to a video update for not just YouTube but also my first video to be uploaded on alternative video platforms such as BitChute. Um, and this is going to be an unusual video for uh, people on my YouTube channel um, who follow my YouTube channel but also uh, to people um, who are going to be viewing this video on BitChute who may not know who I am. Um, so to begin with, uh, just to give a bit of a background. Um, so I'm a computer programmer in my free time. So I am currently working on a video game and I'll be presenting that in this video. Um, and over on my YouTube channel, I did a lot of uh, programming uh, tutorials for people using the programming language called Hacks and what you can do with that language. So on that YouTube channel, um, if it doesn't get taken down, <laughs> um, you will see a lot of uh, programming tutorials revolving around web development, as well as the odd few tutorials, perhaps around C Sharp and other um, tools and languages. But this video is not entirely going to be about programming. In fact, I'm actually going to be showing you uh, the software that I've been working on. And of course, with it being my very first video to be uploaded onto alternative video platforms, this is effectively in preparation for um, effectively an exodus from YouTube. If it isn't because YouTube censors me, it's probably because I just don't want to use that platform anymore. And probably all for the right reasons. Um, I'm not going to go too political in this video. I will create a separate, probably political rant about what's been going on um, over the past year. I'm sure we are all well aware, if you are an alternative media, of what's been going on. Um, you probably are perhaps a little more awake, let's say, um, for lack of a better term, than people who use or still use the mainstream channels. Um, but uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on that. Um, obviously, it's entirely what um, channel you use to uh, put uh, to get your information out on, because not every single video on YouTube that discusses this pandemic in detail, whether for good or bad, happens to be taken down. Um, whether for good or bad, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not really relevant in the grand scheme of things. It's the fact that the videos are being taken down, regardless of the information that's uh, within those videos that um, is a, a big problem. However, that being said, uh, we need to start looking at opportunities. And I'd like to take this opportunity to discuss, um, before going into the actual main content of this video, uh, to discuss uh, what's been happening over the past year, just briefly. Um, so I did do a little rant on my YouTube channel about uh, social distancing and face coverings. This was, this was about a year ago during the initial stages of the pandemic. And um, <laughs> I remember talking about how, oh, you've got all these these stickers on the floor of supermarkets and you have to uh, follow the stickers that show arrows of, um, you have to go left and all this stuff. And it was kind of a mockery and a joke um, between me and some uh, friends and family. Um, not that all of my family uh, uh, believes that it's all insane and ridiculous. Um, some of them actually do go ahead and uh, go by the rules, and that's entirely up to them. But we try our best, of course, to uh, uh, not necessarily convince them or persuade them, but to give them the information that we ourselves have investigated and researched in our own time, and to try to convey that to them. Um, and some, and most of the time, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, I know many colleagues in work um, probably uh, have a very firm 
uh, understanding of their point of view about this pandemic and they will not change their mind and that's unfortunately a little concerning I think um, it's concerning that many people still at this point in time uh, do not consider alternative viewpoints in looking at this pandemic and that is very concerning indeed I think because what that means is is that those people um, they have this understanding this viewpoint that they have in the back of their subconscious that despite everything going on they believe that based on that understanding they're doing what they believe to be right even if it's all for the wrong reasons and that's very concerning it's also concerning to me having to go into that environment practically on a daily basis um, because I it makes me not want to be there <laughs> it makes me uh, feel as if I'm being not listened to um, and completely shut out from any form of knowledge um, you know we all try our best to give information to people and most people just dismiss it they think it's all nonsense or you're uh, coming up with conspiracy theories or something like that it doesn't matter what the categorization of that information is because it's not the categorization of that information that's important it's the information itself that's important and that's how we're being silenced of course is we are being is the information that we put out um, regardless of what form it takes it's the categorization of the information that justifies the need to censor it rather than the information itself and the categorization is defined by what we consider as say fact checkers and obviously you know that's a subject for another time but basically in all for all intents and purposes in my life in what i intend to do uh, is to get out information in a certain form regardless of the categorization in which it is defined by these so-called fact checkers and this is the whole point of this video so as i mentioned at the beginning is that i am working on a video game and in order to aid in developing that i have developed an open source and free platform which is not going to be available immediately um, which is called story dev and i will show you uh how that works uh there's a lot going on in the software um and like i say it's going to be free and open source so let's go ahead and take a look at what it looks like so here we have our story dev application um and we've got a couple of things up here so uh, if we go up here to file open project um, we've got age of atlantis that's the name of the game i am going to select that folder and that's going to open up the project and in here i've got a lot of options as you can see we've got view we've got some resources over here and we've got project none of these buttons actually do anything at the moment i can click on it it doesn't do anything because i haven't implemented that yet um, now the whole point of age of atlantis um, to, before I go into this uh, properly, I should probably introduce Age of Atlantis. So Age of Atlantis is an, in, an interactive story that is designed to hopefully, uh, in a way, um, make people think, make people uh, think a bit differently in a certain manner. So, you know, video games are a mainstream form of communication. Um, and I believe that um, using alternative media, I mean, <laughs> obviously, I can't really say much considering I'm going to be putting this video on alternative media, but um, 
I believe that um, using alternative forms and means of communication is not sufficient enough to um, provide information to people because a lot of people who are not aware of the alternative uh, forms of communication or hell, hell even indeed um, actively uh, refuses to use the alternative forms of communication that, that those are, are the kinds of people that are going to be very difficult to communicate with but we've got to in the alternative arena if you'd like to say that um, we've got to try to use the mainstream communication channels as much as possible to get through to people because it's those kinds of people that don't use alternative forms of communication that are in the dark so this is a video game video games are an are a mainstream channel of information it takes a specific form of course but age of atlantis is uh, an interactive story like i say um, and i will present that uh, the actual game itself uh, shortly but this is the editor here so let's see where should i start i know let's start the chapters basically this is a window this is folders you can add and delete them there we go done that's all we need to know <laughs> um i'm not going to go on to conversations yet because uh there's a lot going on with conversations at the moment there's a it's not quite finished yet um uh, I'm not even sure if this even works properly yet. Um, there's certain things that I'm still working on, but most of the rest of the things that I'd like to talk about does work. So let's start first by bringing up characters. So this is characters. Um, so in this game, obviously, you have characters. Um, all of this, by the way, is on my website, twinsparfw.com. I will present a link in the description below this video for people who want a more detailed written experience versus a video format. Um, but the videos will not be coming out as quickly as the articles will. So if you want to get more immediate information, I would suggest going to twinsparfw.com to get the most up-to-date information the videos will come later anyway so here we've got characters uh, and here we've got our first name and last name and by the way this entire story the interactive story that um, Age of Atlantis is based on is actually based on a on a a franchise called the spiritual transition which i conceived um when i was about 20 21 years old so almost seven eight years ago it was when the spiritual transition the actual uh, game the actual franchise and the idea behind this story actually was conceived a very long time ago um and I actually did start writing a novel um, called Age of Atlantis. Um, and I wrote it for about five years. And eventually I came to the decision that after all of that time writing a novel for five years, I actually got to a fourth draft and then abandoned it. Um, and I think the main reason why is because this is what I can do. You know, I'm a programmer. I'm not a story. I'm not really a, a novel writer. In that, in the traditional sense, really, um, but uh, this is the way to marry it. I think is to ma to marry writing and programming in the way that I can, and this is the way to do it. So anyway, um, we've got characters. So Sonia Castleveld and Caroline Castleveld. These two children, um, so fourteen and ten respectively, are. Uh, the daughters 
of a woman named Susan Castleveld. She was the uh, high cleric of a temple within the inner city of a kingdom called the Morrowlands. And there's a lot of lore and story to be had regarding the Morrowlands. And basically, the story revolves around you um, mostly following the adventure of Sonny and Caroline. And as you go through the story, you'll be playing a variety of other characters, uh, mostly based on uh, royal family. And these members of the royal family, including the daughter of the royal family, that is uh, Jahia, who I haven't defined yet, I haven't created um, Jahia as a character as yet. I will do at some point. Oh, that wasn't good. Um, what the hell just happened there? Well, I do apologize. I was not expecting that to happen. <laughs> you know, you test a lot of things and um, then these things happen and suddenly it doesn't work. I'll fix that later. Um, <laughs> this is why we test, folks. This is why we test. But anyway, um, I will not be doing that again. So, no, I won't be clicking on Guard Rayman. Guard Rayman is a non-player character, so you don't play as a character. So, over here we've got is player character. That basically just means um, that this is a character that you can play as within the game. You've got an initial attitude, um, and basically the way this game works is as you make decisions in conversation, uh, characters' attitudes can change depending on the decision that you make, as well as another system that's also in place called frequency. So frequency is effectively the, um, just say the bread and butter of the game pretty much, where every single decision effectively counts so to speak um, in that every single decision will affect your frequency in some way shape or form so you'll immediately see whether the choice that you've made is good or bad and that will reflect over time so the more negative decisions that you make the more choices that you make that have a negative outcome um, will make will only make the game harder and harder while uh, positive outcome decisions will make the game easier effectively but there will be certain aids along the way there will be certain choices in conversation that might be um, more of a trick on the mind than anything else nevertheless um, we've also got these attitudes here so if I were to right click and edit um, got this attitude so Caroline has an initial attitude towards Sunny as being happy um, real attitude is love so basically what that means is is um, regardless of the change in the attitude between um, say Sunny and Caroline in this instance because of course they're sisters um, in reality they always effectively love each other because they're sisters and they're, part, and they're family so it makes sense to do that. Um, and what that basically means is in the game, as you make, com as you make uh, decisions in conversation or as the game's time progresses and advances, eventually um, the, the, the attitude that they're currently at towards another character will eventually gravitate towards the, uh, the, their real attitude. So if you're making decisions that don't directly affect the attitude of the two characters, eventually the attitude will start increasing or decreasing towards that real attitude. So you can manipulate that somewhat. Um, over here we've got traits. So here we've got Caroline has uh, three different traits that you can help progress. And there's a system in the game called activities. Uh, so basically what happens is, is as you progress through the game, um, there's 
a natural uh, initial attitude that naturally the attitude of each of the player characters will start going down um, so you want to keep that um, up and maintained and the way to maintain that is by completing activities which I'll show you soon um, but by completing activities you progress these traits so in one of them for example this is a oh no not this again you're joking me there's supposed to be a description here um, revolving uh, this, this character's trait again that's something I'm gonna have to fix I thought I fixed that what the hell that does not make sense at all anytime you create a recording and something goes wrong it's one of those days I'm sure of it but anyway so here we've got um, this character's trait uh, Caroline um, cooking is her highest priority so this is uh, something she would love to do. This is her greatest ambition, effectively. Um, the same goes for farming. Um, this is the second highest priority. And then to become a cleric uh, here. Um, it works there, though. Maybe I just forgot to add, enter a description for um, for this one, perhaps. Perhaps that was the reason. Um, but anyway. Uh, however, on the other hand, we've got Sanya who's got also the three traits here, and she considers cleric um, to be her highest priority. So think of Sanya as being more like her mother because Susan, uh, as described, was high cleric of the halls of light. High cleric is effectively the highest rank that you can have um, within the halls of light, which is the, temp the name of the temple in the inner city. And what that means is is that <clears throat> for Sanya, being a cleric is one of the most important things in the world. And obviously that's the description there. So that's what you would see in the game uh, if you were to hover over the, uh, the actual cleric. You would come up with this tooltip and it would describe this. Uh, you've got an initial value of 5 and the maximum value of 30. So, basically, you would have to complete uh, so many activities in order to get the initial value of 5 to the maximum value of 30. Um, and the same would be for the rest of the traits as well here. Um, Sanya, uh, she wants to ascend. So, ascending spiritually is something Sanya strives to achieve, even if the things in the world go completely against her. So, um, again, like her mother, she's quite... Uh, uh, like here in the description for example unlike her sister she is not afraid to speak her mind regardless of consequence so yeah um, you've got some description behind the characters and uh, artifacts research so there's a there's another sis there let me try that again there is another system in Age of Atlantis or in story dev called artifacts we'll go on to that but here we've got Sanya has a peculiar interest in researching artifacts, small heirlooms, or unusually shaped stones. Perhaps if she dedicated some of her time researching them, she could help uncover many mysteries. So despite it being the lowest priority, artifact research is, would actually be very helpful um, because that, this is going to be one of these those traits that's actually going to have a very big impact on the way in which information is conveyed. So if Sanya is the point of uh, view in a conversation, so in conversations you've got a point of view, and whatever your point of view is in the conversation, basically, you, um, whatever decisions that you make in that conversation will happen as if you are that character that as the point of view so if sanya is the point of view uh, in a ca in a conversation then you are making decisions as sanya right and because you are sanya then all of the um attitudes that she has towards other characters will be affected by that um just to note um attitudes uh, towards other characters is limited effectively just to other player characters. So if you've got um, 
say, multiple player characters and you are a point of view of, say, Sanya, for example, like I said, um, and you make a decision that uh, many other player characters think, what the hell are you doing? Um, then that will change their attitude and it will have a negative consequence towards all of the other characters that um, Sanya has. Um, and that will, that will reflect in conversation and it may even reflect later on. So, you know, like I say, if you change, um, if you make too many negative con uh, decisions, then that will have an effect later on. Even if you start um, producing positive results in later conversations, if attitudes towards other characters are still quite negative, then it's going to take a while for uh, those characters to take a liking to you. And that's going to affect conversations uh, and the decisions available in those conversations as well. And I'll explain how that would work when we get on to uh, the conversation system. So, you know, this is, this is just the beginning of a very truly dynamic interactive story. It's not, it's not like, you know, you've got like, say, one of those novels where you read it and then you get to a certain point in the novel and then it says, oh, turn to page 15 to progress or turn to page 11 um, it's not static like that it's very very dynamic in that sense um, so every single decision absolutely does count um, and that will affect um, attitudes towards other characters so moving on a step um, guard Raymond um, I will select him uh, just for the time being so we've got this group here We've also got vendors as well, so that there will be vendors in the game where you'll be able to purchase items from. Um, we've got a dialogue color here that doesn't currently reflect in the game yet, um, but we'll see about that. We've got these groups, so groups come from this option here, character groups. So we've got multiple character groups here. Let's uh, go over to character groups myself so over here um, sorry the writing is a bit small you might need to uh, higher up the resolution on the video um, but basically um, I've got multiple options here so we've got clerics of the halls of light inner city cultists southern moral lands and the Angie um, so we've got five character groups in total and here uh, let's say, for example, Clerics of the Halls of Light. Um, we've got a name, which is the name that I've just mentioned. Default frequency rate. Um, so basically what we've got here is we've got an, an initial frequency of 5. So this is measured in hertz. And then we've also got default frequency rate. So basically, if you've got, if you make a decision in conversation where a character group uh, or say you're uh, speaking to a character that belongs to a certain character group. So if you make a decision that has a positive consequence or a positive outcome, then the frequency of that group that the character is related to will go up. However, if you've got a um, another character in the same conversation but from a different group, who disagrees with the decision that you've made, then the frequency of that group will go down. And basically it changes the dynamic in how those, how the characters within those groups um, interact with you. And how that changes um, in conversation will ultimately be based on a lot of conditions that will be applied to the multiple gossip scenarios that I will show you a little later. Um, now, talking of gossips, um, or what I mean by gossips, um, so we've got another feature here called Places. So if we go over to Places, that's not quite... Um, 
working uh, properly. That needs to be centered, um, so I'll fix that. But um, basically, we've got this description here for Buzzleberry Village, which is the first place of interest that you discover in the game. Uh, here we've got Buzzleberry connects the inner city of the Marlands to its southern rural neighbours. Unlike villages in the south, Buzzleberry rem remains untainted, untainted by cultist influence, at least until recently. Most residents of Buzzleberry Village remain blind to the underground tunnels underneath their township, but ponder endlessly at the reports of missing children. So there's um, some controversy uh, stirring up regarding the mayor of the Buzzle of Buzzleberry Village, um, what killed him, uh, etc. And as Sonny and Caroline, who explores that village right at the very beginning of the game, if you choose to do so, it's entirely optional, um, then you'll be able to figure out what's going on and how to solve it, etc. And here, as I mentioned before, we've got these activities. So if I just right click and edit, we've got this activity called Prepared Journey. Um, so this is part of Sanya's character trait Ascension. So if we were to click on this, um, we can search uh, across all of these uh, traits that belong in this game uh, across multiple characters. So we've got Sonia and Caroline, they're all here. Um, so we can select any of these and we can filter on them as well. So we've got this character trait, so this activity relates to this trait. So this is what I was talking about, about the activities and how completing them um, will progress their trait. So Sanya's Ascension, if you were to complete this activity, then her points towards this uh, trait Ascension goes up by two. And for each um, part completed, so these are the parts here, for each part completed, which is based on journals, um, then the ascension will go up by one. These two do not overlap. So basically, if you complete part three, um, then you don't get that one. You actually get two points instead. Um, now, as you can see, we've also got this option called hidden until discovered. Basically, what that means is we're not going to see this activity shown under the places in the game until we've got a script that activates or unlocks this particular activity. Now we've got multiple parts here. Um, so basically each part is based on journals, which I will go to in a minute. So we've got uh, each journal, uh, we've got a starting journal and an ending journal. They're part of the same journal. So um, each of these parts uh, will have, you know, investigating the kidnappings. That's one journal starting from page two and ending on page five so basically once you complete this journal up to, starting from page two up to page five once you've done that you've completed this part and Sanya's trait ascension goes up by one point um, towards 20 and there will be a way to track that eventually um, so that's all fine uh, if we go over to sections, so this is what I was talking about gossips for. Um, so if we right click and edit, we've got Westgate here. This is the only section that exists at the moment. But um, west of the village is a gate guarded by one. Guard Raymond stands idly scanning the plains below him of trespassers. Um, so here we've got it's visible to player. So it's automatically visible to the player once any and all conditions are met. So We've got here, um, entrance fulfilled. This section becomes available once any and all sections marked as always have had any scripted events fulfilled. And that's actually technically incorrect for this one. Should be always. Um, <laughs> We've got entered from. Um, again, you can you know search for a place that you'd like to find. That, find um, in this case, I don't need to do anything for that. Um, so that's all good. 
And then we've all, we've got this gossip uh, system here. So this, this is what I was talking about. So if you were to go to this place, you will immediately see a section. Then that section, you will have a character that you can talk to called Guard Raymond. So that's probably what you would do, right? Now, here we've got one display option and it's called um, Hello. Now, this option is available if the option has not already been chosen. So that's what that means here. Um, it's in black writing, I do apologize. Um, uh, that should probably be a bit lighter so it can be seen, but um, nevertheless, uh, we there's nothing going on here. This is the actual main script body here. This is you might not be able to see it, but this is a different code editor to this condition here. But um, that basically, when you select this in the conversation or the options that are available to you uh, this body of uh, the script body would execute and you will probably have say the ability to construct code so i just hit control p there that brings up this window and i can go over to this place here and i can probably say oh, i want to start a conversation and the conversation is going to be some conversation in here or something right something like that there's a lot of options here, like adjust frequency. Um, I can execute something else, like say adjust character attitude to whatever. Um, we can uh, adjust consume an item. As uh, so there's a, a couple of items here that's in the game, etc., uh, etc. Et you get the idea, right? Um, we can of course edit them as well. So if I were to say set character attitude of Sanya to upset for whatever reason why she would do that when she talks to Guard Raymond, we have no idea. But she gets upset when we talk to Guard Raymond for whatever reason. Um, but let's say we don't really want that. So we can just F6 on that uh, function and change that to content instead. So she's actually all right. Um, <laughs> and then we can, of course, submit that. And yeah, it does that. Um, but I don't want that, so I'm going to get rid of that for the time being. <coughs> there should be a semicolon there. But that's scripting. Um, that's basically that in a nutshell. Don't need to do anything else with that. So, that's all done. That's all good. Um, we go to the journal sections. This is what, we, what I was talking about, about the um, journals. Uh, again, Ignore the fact that some things are a little out of position. <laughs> so we've got a lot of uh, journals here. Um, <laughs> there's quite a few that... Uh, so this is part of the main story, right? Some brief introductions um, going into the village or not. Um, then we've got some others that are part of the main story. Um, that aren't part of the main story. Um, and uh, yeah, there's quite a lot already going on. There's a couple of things in here. So this is, again, a script. Um, where should I go? There's something else. Uh, where is it? Uh, let's see. Where is it? What, what am I looking for? Um, it is somewhere. I, I'm sure of it. Where is it? Must be somewhere else. Uh, let's see. No, not that one. That one? Yes, it's this one. I don't remember that. So here. Here we are. So on page five, we've got this brackets. Um, so we've got on one side, we've got something to display. And then the condition on which to display this text. So if we were to control P here, nothing happens. But if we control P here, this happens. So there is a way that the that story dev can detect whether or not it's um, uh, 
a part of the code or not. And we can edit the code that exists there and submit and do whatever we need to. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, we've got this, uh, like, like I said, we've got this part of the main story. Or if it isn't, then we go up. We, we're available until a certain chapter. So once we reach this section of chapter introduction, then this journal entry temporary shelter no longer exists. Or um, it might be available in the journal, but we don't actually have any access. Um, we can't complete it. And you will be notified of that. Over here, we've got items. So we've got icons that do, of course, display. So this is the first time we actually do see icons. Um, so where do we get that? Icon sets here. So we've got items, also called artifacts. Yes, I do have a little bit of graphic, uh, 2D graphic skills. It's not brilliant, but uh, it will do for the purposes of this game. It's one of the reasons why um, I'm not making anything too complicated. Um, well, I say too complicated. There's oh, this game is obviously complicated, but um, in terms of graphical fidelity, it's not going to be complicated in that sense. But I make up for it for the number of systems I'm put, putting in place uh, for this game. So as you can see, we've got items, and these are the items that currently exist. These are the two D graphics that exist, and uh, the same for artifacts as well. Um, so each of these items is quite a lot going on as you can see um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because time is getting on almost 42 minutes in already so we've got a description for this uh, rare item called Crelicti and when you use it something happens <laughs> basically what the script is doing is it's uh, getting all of the available choices within the current conversation at the time and it will highlight the choice that is the best outcome in that scenario and because that is so powerful um there is a use call down of 12 conversations so you can't use the crelicti crystal again until after 12 conversations have passed um that might even that probably is still too powerful but we'll see that in practice um We've got item use context. Now this is quite important because there's going to be some automated decision making that uh, happens in the game. So if there's no choices available, let's say for example, um, you're wounded and you're no longer in a situation where you can no longer be wounded. Um, if an item is has this wound, uh, item use context here, then basically what that means is if one of your characters is wounded, then this item will be used automatically um, to heal that wound. If it isn't, then a conversation would happen um, to say, uh, basically in a certain scenario or a certain part, part of the game where, it, um, where the context suits it, um, where a conversation between characters would happen to say, oh, I'm wounded what are we going to do um, and then you'd have to try and find a way to solve that problem because you don't actually have the item available to heal that wound um, so again it's producing some kind of more of a dynamic uh, scenario again same with uh, feed so item use context feed would basically mean if you're if one of your characters gets hungry in a conversation and you don't have any food um, then again it would fall onto a conversation whereby the characters are hungry and you've got to figure out a way to sort that out um, so there's a lot of things you have to kind of think about um, with regards to that and again with uh, melee combat and ranged combat um, in a conversation for example if you've got if you say, um, for example, there's no other alternative and you're backed into a corner, for example, um, which if you've actually made decisions that have been positive most of the time, then 
you probably would not end up in that scenario. But if it so happens that you made quite a few negative choices in the past that have affected, say, a certain group, like, for example, the cultists, um, and the cultists might not necessarily um, act particularly nice to you um, anyway, because that's just the way that's just the way they are. That's the nature of the game. The cultists are effectively the antagonists. Um, so if you've got a negative uh, frequency, if you've got a low frequency um, in general and you've got a low frequency with that group as well, um, then it may be the case that the only option you've got is this item in your inventory that gives you the ability to attack and that might be the only option you have in that scenario. Otherwise, you die and it's effectively game over. So there are multiple failure points in the game. If you cannot solve a particular situation in the game, then um, you can reach game over. It is possible. And of course, you know, like, like for example this, there, this is uh, considered knowledge. So when you get to a certain point in the game in Buzzleberry Village, once you try to expose the cultists for what they're doing and you expose the fact that the cultists are effectively in control of Buzzleberry Village, spoiler alert, <laughs> um, then this item actually becomes an option to use in conversation and that can then of course be used to expose the cultists and to persuade people that yes the cultists are indeed in control um, in this village and here's the evidence to prove it and uh, yeah as you can imagine you can see how complicated this game could effectively become, um, at least for me, but uh, obviously I'm the one making it. Um, uh, let's move on to artifacts. Um, here, so here we've got artifacts. Um, so every artifact has a very big description uh, tied to them. Um, I'm not gonna scroll through that because it's a big spoiler and I don't want to do that so I'm not going to scroll uh, through that at all um, however we've got this unlocked by default so basically what that means is is if the artifact has not already been unlocked then it um, it's either unlocked by default i.e. no script needs to unlock it or if it isn't unlocked by default then a script would have to unlock it this rarity is common. Um, there's three rarities, common, rare, extra rare. We've got a frequency, C frequency. So this is where a frequency becomes important. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a state of frequency that is tied with the game. So this is your general frequency. This is not frequency towards groups. This is the general frequency. And this is what this relies on. So if, say, for example, you see an artifact that because your frequency is at say three hertz but your frequency is not in fact at say 3.3 hertz in which case you can see the frequency you can see the artifact but you can't actually acquire it so you might actually have to uh, find a way to um, raise your frequency in order to actually acquire the artifact and you would be able to do that um, by completing uh, say journals um, and making decisions uh, that raises your frequency such that what, when you go back to acquire that artifact you can do so and that might be and that you can imagine would become more difficult as time goes on um, there's fragments so you don't um, you don't um, acquire the artifact itself you acquire the artifact fragments so as you um, uh, go through the game as you can see we've got all of these uh, fragments that exist um, tied to these uh, icons that I just showed you here um, and obviously you can select them um, but 
basically you acquired the artifacts and once you've, once you've acquired all of them then you've acquired the entire artifact and that's pretty much it for uh, artifacts don't want to click on too many we've also got this set use contexts here um, that's the uh, that's this bit here in the background on use context um, that's important because uh, What was I going to say? Mine just gone blank. Yeah. That, so basically, if if you're in a conversation where the context relates to, say, Puzzleberry Village, for example, then the artifact actually becomes available for you to use as a form of evidence. However, once you've used that artifact as a form of evidence, then you've effectively activated the artifacts and you can't use it again. Um, so you want to be probably a bit careful about that. Um, because like in this instance, for example, this also relates to both Coltis Law and Buzzleberry Law. So you might not necessarily want to use this artifact um, until, say, in Buzzleberry Village to expose the cultists that control Buzzleberry Village, you might want to use it in a different context outside of Buzzleberry Village because it still relates to the cultists. So if there's a conversation later on that relates to cultists, then you can use this uh, artifact then. So it gives you some choices there. Uh, we've got the special feature, um, which means flashback scenarios. So uh, flashback scenarios is a special feature of Age of Atlantis, which basically means that you can not go back in time, but you can go back to a point where a certain scenario occurred and you can help aid the characters within that scenario get through that scenario. Once all of the choices that you make in that scenario is important the first time around, but repeated times um, will not make a difference. Um, however, in this case, what I have done is I have allowed the ability to overwrite lower scores. So what that means is, is that if, say, we're um, completing this scenario, for example, back to mining, return to the point when Sanya and Callum were still mining underground and help them escape, if, say, we were to repeat that, there will be a, some kind of scoring system in the background that actually produces a slightly different outcome for the end game. Um, so that can be overwritten, so it's not entirely pointless to repeat it, but um, what it does mean is that the choices that you made the first time around uh, in conversations are set in stone and cannot be changed in repeated runs of the scenario. And finally, we've got achievements here. Achievements, I mean, there's not really much to say about this, apart from the fact that it's, you know, it's achievements. You earn achievements when you complete certain things. And I was c considering whether or not it's even worth putting in achievements but then I thought to myself you know what it's something that people can use to determine what they want to do in the game so you know we see achievements in a lot of games um, and it's not always something that people enjoy because it kind of sets them on a kind of mindset where oh if I don't complete this I'm not completing the game or something like that um, that's not entirely true for this game. Um, just because you don't complete an achievement doesn't mean it's the end of the world or anything like that. Achievements are there because it's an achievement, not because it's something that is just randomly there for the sake of it. Um, like in a lot of video games, you know, say for example, you know, you, you, uh, get an achievement for example where you reach five hertz in frequency 
that's basically a pointless achievement. There's no point in having those achievements, um, achievements like that. So, you know, for achievements as simple as that, there's no point in doing. There's no point in having those kinds of achievements. I am for achievements as long as they actually feel like an achievement. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Um, finally, to uh, complete this video, hopefully before the one hour mark, we've got this conversation editor. And uh, if we were to open a conversation, we will see this is effectively where everything um, comes to fruition. Um, so over here, I've got this. So I click on introduction. Um, this is linked up to do not comply and ready for a fight. These are the two choices um, that are available um, at the introductory chapter. And this is what you'll come across. This is effectively what you would get in terms of the conversation that would happen right at the very, right at the very beginning of the game. And we've got two choices down here. Um, do not comply and ready for a fight. Um, is current point of view. This was just a test um, just to make sure it was working. Um, I don't need that anymore. I need an option to delete that. <laughs> I haven't got that there yet. Um, so it might be a good idea to implement that. But basically what you're seeing here is uh, um, I thought I fixed that. Uh, I'll, I probably didn't. That's just bit me being stupid, obviously. But never mind. Um, basically, you get the idea, right? We've got two choices. Do not comply and ready for a fight. Clicking on either either one of these will bring up the uh, um, the conversation within that as well. And there's and this is actually a scripting engine as well. There's a script scripting engine called Story Dev. Uh, technically, it's called Story Dev Two. It's available on GitHub actually. Um, so maybe I'll put a link in the description if I can remember to do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, as you can see, there's a lot going on. And Story Dev is literally, this is pretty much the foundations, to be fair. This is nowhere near the finished product. Um, this is pretty much half of it's done. Um, the other half is making sure that I can put everything together simulating um, everything up to certain points so when I were if I were to open up a file for example later on um, in conversation then what that would do is it would simulate up to that point and change all the variables and I can see what variables are it would change for either a worst or a best case scenario and then I can determine based on that what would be the best variables to check uh, and check certain conditions so that I know um, what conversation could happen between certain characters, etc., etc. You know, it, it could get very easily complicated, as you can imagine. But, um, you know, whether this game actually ends up completing, considering the way this world is going, I have no idea. But it's something that I'm working on. And as you can see, considering how much I've done already, there's no point, you know, turning around and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm already so far into this now, and there's no point stopping. So that is Story Dev in a nutshell, and there's still many things that haven't been done yet. But I'm going to cap this video off because I've been going on for almost an hour now. So, thank you very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed uh, watching this um, video and taking a look at what we're going to be um, looking at in the future. So, to summarise, Story Dev is an editor that will be available at some point free and open source um, despite all the work that has gone into it um, it won't be available immediately like i said because obviously i want to release a game with it so once the game has in fact been 
completed up to a certain point, then I'll d decide to release a story dev at that time as well. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.